Our scripture lesson for today is most familiar and most often read on Good Friday. It's a very special um, a glimpse into Jesus's last hours here on earth. But God's word is timeless for all times of our life. And as we conclude this sermon series on healing, I wanted this morning to talk about the healing power that hope can have in our lives. I'm reading to you from Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 32. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him, meaning with Jesus. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanging there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom? He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. My brothers and sisters, this is the living word from our living God. Let us all say, Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God of all hope, bring to us your word of hope as we hear once again your word and as we live each day in your world. Let us experience the healing power of your hope in our lives. Amen. Now, some of you may have heard this story, but it's good enough to repeat. According to the Texas newspaper report, poor Chippy never knew what hit him. One moment, this bird was peacefully singing in his cage, and the next moment, his world was turned upside down. Chippy's problems began when his owner decided to clean his cage with a vacuum cleaner. About that time, the phone rang and she got distracted for just a moment, and before you knew it, swoop, Chippy was gone. She quickly turned off the vacuum cleaner, opened the canister, and there he lay, stunned, but still alive. He was filthy, so she took him to the sink and washed him off. By now, Chippy was shivering and cold, so what did this compassionate bird owner do? Why, she blasted him with her hairdryer. 
later when commenting to the Texas reporter on Chippy's recovery, she said, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. <laughs> Any of you ever feel like Chippy? Like your world has become chaotic and shaken and you just don't feel like singing anymore. It can happen to anyone. I recall a parishioner two appointments ago telling me his company had reorganized and in the process his job was discontinued. This meant no income, which meant he could no longer make his child support payments, so his wife refused to let him see the children. And now that he had no medical insurance, he didn't have the resources to check into that squeezing pain in his chest. With weariness, he said to me, you know, if I had my life to do over again, I'm not sure I'd have the strength. Life has its way, doesn't it? Of shaking us up and spinning us around and spitting us out. As the bumper sicker says, and I'm gonna clean this up a little bit, stuff happens <laughs> and don't we know it's true but my friends I have hopeful word for anyone who is feeling weary and washed up this morning st. Luke tells us the story Jesus has been condemned to death, shamed in public, and then nailed excruciatingly to a wooden cross. There is no escape. He's literally out on the limb. And now he's hanging on the hill between two convicts. The first one turns to Jesus and offers him a word of sarcasm. Luke says he derides Jesus. You call yourself God, well, your holiness, what have you done for me lately? Do you hear that tone? That's bitterness. And when we're weary beyond the point of coping, that is, in fact, one option for us. We can give in to bitterness, let our despair become aggressive, let our wounds take control of our lives, let frustration have the last word and the final say over our attitude and our behavior in life. Many of you will remember the story of Job. Poor old guy. He lost his family. He lost his health. He lost everything he owned. Life sucked him up, washed him out, and blew him away. And his wife said, why don't you just curse God and then die? In other words, get bitter, Job. Lash out. Unleash your anger on God. When you're feeling broken and washed up, one optional response is bitterness. But the problem with bitterness is that it never allows a wound to heal. In fact, our bitterness only deepens and infects our wounds. Back in the frontier days of the American West, pioneers had to contend with marauding wolves, which attacked their cattle, attacked their sheep and their horses. Defeating the wolves was a matter of their survival. But wolves are crafty and strong creatures. So how do you defeat a wolf? 
Well, the settlers learned a trick from their Native American neighbors. You take a sharp hunting knife, plant it in the ground, blade up, and then coat it with buffalo fat. The wolf comes along, smells the fat, and licks it off the blade. And when the wolf licks the blade, the, blice, the blade slices his tongue, which then starts to bleed. And now the wolf tastes the blood, and not knowing it's his own blood, he licks the knife more voraciously until he meets his own demise. Now, do I need to explain that analogy here? The point is, bitter rage may taste sweet, but eventually it will kill us. It will. Jesus is crucified between two thieves, and one is bitter. But the other one illustrates for us an alternative to bitterness. It's called hope. Say that with me. Hope. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Convicted and crucified, this man, a social disaster, he knows where he's going and he knows why. He must figure he's going to go straight to hell because he has made this earth so hellish for others. But he meets Jesus there. And something about this man, he knows Jesus, this preacher, has been beaten and slashed and crucified, and still Jesus refuses to attack his attackers. No bitterness in that heart, only love. I like to imagine this thief realizes he's never been in better company. And so he says, Jesus, remember me. That's all he's hoping for, a good word in Jesus' memory. Just honor me with a passing thought here and there. Bless me with an occasional recollection. Jesus, remember me. And Jesus says today, you and me in paradise. I got to say, wow. Do you get the impact of that promise? It's like asking someone for a ride and they give you a brand new car. It's like asking to borrow a quarter and someone gives you $500,000. All the thief asked for was a memory, and Jesus offers him paradise. But that's the way hope works. At least that's the way it works at the cross. You see, at the cross, God exceeds all of our expectations. At the cross, we discover a God who will go to any lengths, who will do whatever it takes to save us. If God must take on human form to save us, here comes Christmas and the baby in the manger. If God has to take on our shame and humiliation to save us, here comes Good Friday and the cross. And if God has to defeat our greatest foe, death, then look out because ultimately comes Easter and the empty tomb. Our God will do whatever it takes to give us paradise. Death will never have the last word because God has the last word and the final say for our lives. And that word is what? Hope. Hope. 
Our hope knows, or lies in knowing that we are loved by a God who exceeds all our expectations, a God who will never give up on us, a God who will do whatever it takes to save us. I'm old enough, maybe some of you are as well, to remember the story of Jessica McClure. Remember that one? She was just 18 months old when she toddled into her backyard and fell into an abandoned well shaft. For the next 58 hours, the world watched with bated breath as repeated attempts were made to rescue baby Jessica. And then on October 16th, we exhaled a collective sigh of relief when Robert O'Donnell, a paramedic from Midland, Texas, freed Jessica from that 22-foot deep, eight-inch wide well hole. Finally, her ordeal was over and baby Jessica was safe. But Jessica's story didn't end with her rescue. She was alive, but the ordeal left her with some medical problems that required 13 reconstructive surgeries. She had 60% of her right foot amputated, and she still bears visible scars from the incident. Now, how do you think Jessica has responded to her scars now that she's not a baby anymore. When she was 11 years old, she told the Ladies' Home Journal, I'm proud of them. I have my scars because I survived. And then a few years later, at the age of 16, Jessica appeared on Good Morning America and said, my scars remind me of how much God loves me. Now let those words sink in a moment. When life chews you up and spits you out, you have two options. You can get angry and bitter with God, or you can praise God because he loves you, because he has promised to be with you, and because he will sustain you through all of the times of your life. You can look to the cross, to the scars that Jesus bears, and have hope, knowing God will do whatever it takes takes to save you, to share paradise with you. Now, I don't even pretend to imply that a hope-filled life will be carefree or easy. You all know better, don't you? Hope did not remove the thief from his situation. His cross was still a cross. Hope does not mean that you and I will sail through our lives without scars. Hope doesn't mean that you will be relieved of all your pain. Hope does not mean that your prodigal child will come home. But hope does guarantee that you won't be consumed by bitterness that you won't be destroyed by your destructive circumstances, and hope will prepare you to face whatever trials and tribulations may come your way. My friends, I have had my own share <laughs> of sorrows and disappointments. They're right here on the surface, I got to tell you. And there have been times when I felt like I just couldn't cope, when I couldn't muster the strength to sing. But am I bitter? No way. I know that God has the last word and the final say for my life 
and God's word for me and God's word for you is hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When all my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand.